which is in front of you. We'll turn to hymn number 141. It came upon a midnight clear. We'll sing the first verse, the second verse, and the last of hymn number 141. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song. Turn hymn number 148. Hymn number 148. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. tonight for another service. We had a great day this morning, full house with the kids, did a wonderful job, and we thank the Lord for that. It was a great time. Appreciate Brother Tyler and all those workers. Uh, Brother Bill Hastings, right after the service, came up to me, and he showed me a newspaper clipping. I told you in the message that in the last days, things like this uh, were going to get worse and more prevalent, but Brother Bill handed me a uh, clipping from the St. Pete Times or Tampa Times. Uh, 22 children were attacked this same week. Now, we haven't heard as much about it because it happened in China, but 22 children were attacked with a knife outside of their school uh, and uh, just cut, stabbed. And uh, it's, it's the end days, it's the end times when these things are just going to wax worse and worse. And uh, we need to be vigilant, we need to be uh, after it, thanking the Lord for. Uh, our own children, but also trying to reach others. And that's why the bus ministry and the children's program and all those things uh, that we need to be involved in. But we're glad that you're here tonight. Do we have anybody first time or first time in a long time? We have several guests back with us. And it's uh, good to see the Marshall family. I met this dear family 
uh, this morning, and uh, they're veteran missionaries. You like that? You've been a missionary long enough to be a veteran missionary uh, in the country of Australia, and uh, their claim to fame is they're friends of the Brickells, and we're not going to hold that against them, amen? But uh, they're, they're uh, home furlough and been uh, nine years, I believe it is, in, in Australia. Brother Joe, make your way up here. We'll ask you to lead in prayer in this moment. And then also, uh, it's good to have visitors who get in the choir with us. Uh, this is Miss Ostertag, soon to be uh, Miss Worley. And uh, or this is Caleb's fiance. Those of you that have been around a long time, you know the Ostertag family. Uh, and you pray for her as she knows not what she does. Amen. But uh, anyway, we're glad that you're here tonight. Guests and visitors, thank you. Good to have uh, Ms. Rappersaw home from school, Ms. Hurst home from school. Uh, what a blessing to have our young ladies back. And we're thankful. I want you to pray now. Uh, I did not mention it. Right during the end of service, I got word that my nephew, Brendan, had been rushed into emergency surgery. Brendan was uh, messing around yesterday with a friend of his. And uh, they, they jumped and they ran into each other. Just a freak accident. And they, he, he uh, tore his lung. And uh, the doctor completely missed it, sent him home, excruciating pain. Another doctor came in this morning, was just checking x-rays from the night before, said, get this boy back in here. And uh, they've gone immediately now. This was all right after church this morning. They, uh, from what I understand, they went into his lung trying to, trying to brother, you're, you're saying yes, so you read that. They're trying to expand that lung back out. But this is my little 15-year-old nephew, Brendan. Uh, I tease Brendan that he's so tough and rough. He'd break an anvil, uh, but uh, he's in a lot of pain, so you pray for him. He's in the hospital there in Beaumont. Appreciate it. Joe, come pray for us, please. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come to your house and to gather around your word. Lord, we pray that it be with our country in this time. We pray that it be with the Christians in the area that are affected. Lord, may they be a testimony and a light for you. May they show your love to those around them. Lord, I pray that be with the different health situations and the surgery that took place. Pray that your will be done there and that health will be returned. Pray that be with the rest of the service. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Listen to the choir sing. family this morning visiting. I didn't know they were here till at the end of the service. And uh, they go to Old Swanee Baptist Church right outside of north of Atlanta there. Uh, the son and his father passed away here in St. Pete. And uh, somebody said, you know, I know a good church in that area that will help you. And so Wednesday afternoon, I'm doing the funeral of a retired United States Air Force veteran. Uh, served his entire career. Was a training instructor at Lackland. Four tours of Vietnam. 
an American hero. They came up after the service today. And, you know, you never know who's sitting behind, beside you or behind you, around you, and where they may be. And uh, met that precious family. And, you know, you be a blessing to someone today because you may need a blessing tomorrow, right? And we thank the Lord for that. But glad reunion day. I mentioned this morning, one of my childhood heroes, Miss Margie Ashby, went home to be with the Lord this morning, uh, this week. And I uh, just thought about that all afternoon, that one of these days... Uh, it'll be like a glorious reunion day where we'll never have to say goodbye again. Uh, we used to sing, like, y'all know the song, We'll Never Say Goodbye in Glory. Y'all remember that song? How many of you know that song, We'll Never Say Goodbye in Glory? Three of you, what a blessing, amen. I'm going to teach you that, not now, but I'm going to teach you that song because one of these days we're never going to have to say goodbye again. And I remember at Dr. Rice's funeral, I was a little boy when Dr. Rice died, and uh, I remember Ray Hart singing, uh, I'll see you again. And, you know, that's a great truth for the believers that we don't have to say goodbye. It's just a temporary party. And I'm looking forward to that. Let's stand together. And we've got guests and visitors. Thank you for being back tonight. Uh, meet this good missionary family. If I'm not mistaken, this is the Hart family over here. And these are missionaries going to Hawaii. And before you say, oh, I wish I were going, Hawaii has an epidemic with drugs. Number two, the Eastern religions have so moved in there. And number three, you know who owns Hawaii besides China and Japan? The Mormon church. And so here's a needy field. And by the way, if you feel sorry for them, or if you feel like you'd like to take, take, change place with them, uh, the cost of living there is four to five times anything you'll face here. So if you like paying $4 a gallon of gas here, imagine what it is across there. So the Hart family here, uh, Brother Joe and his precious family over here. So we've got good missionary families to meet, guests and friends. Rebecca, play us through. Choir, come down. God bless you. We're glad you're here. Let's take our hymnal, we'll turn to hymn number 137. 
Hymn number 137, Joy to the World, will sing the first, the second, and the last verse of hymn number 137. Ready? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in and heaven and nature see. pages over to hymn number 144. Hymn number 144, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. Hymn number 144. favorite Christmas carol you have a mine is silent night if that if I had to pick uh, just a Christmas carol uh, I think that is a beautiful song I love the little phrase Jesus Lord at thy birth Uh, he laid aside voluntarily his deity to become humanity and I just love that how many of you have another song what's uh, what's somebody else's favorite song Bill what's yours oh that's a beautiful song I love that somebody else says John Old little town. Uh, wasn't it interesting, Dr. Sexton, teaching us a little bit about Bethlehem 
as the royal sheep hold there where they would see the sheep to be born to see if they would be worthy of temple sacrifice. And that's where our Lord was born. By the way, uh, there were several Bethlehems, and yet Micah prophesied the exact Bethlehem. Not just a Bethlehem, but the exact Bethlehem. Anybody else got a favorite one? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Bill? That is a, that's a good song. We don't think of it as a Christmas song. Uh, the other night, Valerie and them sang, uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And uh, just love that. Uh, when Bill raised his hand, I thought, oh, great. Here comes Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Frosty the Snowman. I, I knew that's where we were going. You may be seated. Take your Bible. The book of Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. Miss Nancy has been under the weather. And I love to see, uh, hear Nancy sing. But she's been a bit under the weather trying to uh, recover, so I appreciate uh, her willingness to sing, just not her ability right this moment. Joe, can you give me three minutes? Can you give me five minutes? I'm going to have you come back at a later time, but since we have no special tonight, Brother Hart, can you give three minutes? If you go over three, I promise you'll never be supported in my lifetime. <laughs> Joe, three minutes. Joe, you come first. Brother Hart, you come second. That's six minutes. Ready? Start it. You better run. No, come on, fellas. <laughs> Brother Hart, you come on. Make your way up here, please. I love missionaries. I, I married into a missionary family 19 years ago, and uh, my father-in-law, my wife, my in-laws taught me to love missionaries. Every church, this church and the one in Texas, I believe God has blessed our church because we've tried to love on missionaries a little bit. And uh, Brother Joe, you come first. You have three or four minutes. And then Brother Hart, you come have three or four minutes. Well, let me start off by saying I thank you when we pulled in this morning and I saw the bus ministry. That's a special thing to me and to my mother as well. We were reached through the bus ministry yeah, and through door-to-door -door visitation. Uh, well, in 2000, November 1, 2003, we arrived in Australia in Brisbane. And as we were there, we worked with a missionary in a church and we helped in their Bible Institute get started. The first graduate of that Bible Institute became the pastor of Great Hope Baptist Church there in, uh, in the Brisbane area. In 2004, uh, I think it was October 24, 2004, we arrived in Darwin. We had about 14 people meet in our living room, and we started the Gateway Baptist Church in that area. And everyone, including the people that were there, the very first people we had looked at me and said, you'll be gone in six months. Right. I thought, I love you too. Thank you for coming to our church. <laughs> and you just joined. Oh, wow, this is going to be fun. And so every, every six months, they tell me I'd be gone in six months. After about two, two and a half years, they were gone. We were still there. Um, and God just provided miraculously in that area. It's an area where every Australian pastor that's ever preached for me has said, Brother, I'm glad you're there because I sure won't be. Um, but it's a very transient area. We have a lot of Amer Australian military and mining. So, but every two years, we have a completely new church. I have to start over again. Uh, there's been about, in eight years, about ten different churches that we've pastored there, but God's sent those people out into churches all around Australia and the world, um, still serving God. In 2007, God gave us the opportunity of a, to help a group of people in Cairns. Uh, we are a church sponsored in another missionary, start, help them start the Coastline Baptist Church. That church is growing well, and five years down the road, they're looking for an Australian pastor to come and take that church. And then in 2011, uh, we had a gentleman move from Sydney to a town three hours south of us. It was one of those towns that every year our family went down and we went uh, time to get away. And whenever we left Catherine, my wife or I would look at each other and say, we are, it's nice to be here, but we sure wouldn't want to live here. And it's about 8,000 people, three hours in the middle of nowhere. And that family moved there and began driving three hours one way to come to our church. And so after about four months of doing that, three hours here, three hours back, we offered to start Bible studies there with six people. And that turned into about 25 or 30 people. And we prayed that God would send a missionary there that we could turn that work over to, and he has. And so that Bible study has been turned into the Savannah Way Baptist Church. Um, and they've now filed all the paperwork to bring the missionary over. And then we brought in another missionary family that we've turned Gateway Baptist Church over to. So in the eight or nine years, that we, eight years we've been in Darwin, nine total in Australia, our church had a part in seeing three churches started. Yeah. Every one of those churches supports Australian missionaries around the world. And so it's exciting to see what God's doing, especially in a place where everyone told us it was impossible. Well, with our God, nothing's impossible. Yeah. We're excited to return to Australia roughly the middle of next year. And we're looking forward to where the Lord would have us served in the next however many years he has us there in Australia. Amen. 
every missionary that I've ever talked to, come on, Brother Hart. Every missionary I've ever talked to said that Australia is the graveyard of missionaries. They just will not stay there because of the difficulty. And uh, we're talking this morning, uh, two men that I find to be tremendous encouragers and the great Bible teachers, Brother Bax and then Brother Shemesh. They are close friends with Brother uh, Shemesh's people. In fact, Good Shepherd there. But uh, two of the best Bible teachers that I've ever met came out of Australia and there and uh, pastoring. So let's pray for Brother Joe. We'll get to know more about them. Brother David, make sure you get all uh, information them. Then, Brother Hart, I've met you, uh, but I met your, da- your daughter. <laughs> you look a little older, brother. Uh, I met your wife. At Brother Ken's funeral, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, brother, brother Ken's funeral. And so I met her. Brother Hart, you come and tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Sure. If you're from Bible Baptist, you know, there's a little bit of connection there. Well, my name's Kevin Hart, and this is my wife, Lori, as you mentioned. And if you were to take a globe and find Jerusalem on the globe and take a stake and stick it right through there, come out on the other side, you'd come out on the island of Oahu, literally the uttermost parts of the world. And that's where the Lord's called me to. I got saved when I was five years old at a little small church in LaBelle, Florida. And I grew up in a Christian home. I was always looking at the grass on the other side of the fence. Couldn't wait till I can get out from underneath my parents' authority and uh, live life uh, on my own. So I joined the military as soon as I got out. <laughs> got stationed over in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and uh, worked on nuclear submarines. Did the things that sailors do. Uh, talked like a sailor. Uh, drank like a sailor. If you would have met me, you would have never guessed I was a Christian. Didn't look like a Christian. Didn't act like a Christian. Certainly didn't represent the Lord Jesus Christ as a Christian. Uh, got out of the military and went back to Hawaii to try to live. It's very expensive, like he mentioned over there. Everything has to be imported from the mainland. So if you can imagine, a gallon of milk costs about $10. A quarter orange juice is about $9. And a, a, a gas is about a dollar more than here. But it, it's very expensive. If you don't know Japanese as a second language, you're not a local there. It's very difficult to find work. And uh, I soon ended up living on the streets there. I began to sell drugs and began hook, got hooked on drugs myself. Uh, crystal meth is an epidemic on that island. The little island of Oahu leads this nation in crystal meth use. You can imagine that. There's not one person's life on that island who's not been affected in some way by that drug. And so I, I, my whole life was a nightmare. I remember I was walking down the streets of IA and I was thinking to myself, is this it? Is this life? Because if this is all there is to life, I'm done with it. I climbed up on top of a 16-story building I was going to jump off. I remember I was looking at the asphalt parking lot thinking to myself, me and Kevin, just jump. It'll be like water. All your problems will be over. I stepped back, and I just kind of prayed, Lord, if you could just somehow get me back to where I once was, I'll serve you. Amen. I remember the, the peace that was in my life uh, when I was living for the Lord and uh, in, in a Christian home and going to church and the nightmare my life was now. And I took a step forward to jump. My cell phone started ringing. It was my sister from Fort Myers. Had no idea what I was going through. I was too ashamed to let my family know the life I was living. She was crying on the other end of the phone. She said, Kevin, God just put you on my heart. I want you to come home. Please come home. I bought you a plane ticket. I said, okay, I'll come. I hung up the phone and thought, wow, God just heard me. God just heard me. Man, I left all my stuff behind. It wasn't that much. Had one of those electronic tickets. Went to the Honolulu airport. Flew back to Florida. Still had a lot of problems. I didn't get to where I was overnight. I didn't come out of where I was overnight. I checked myself into a Christian um, rehab program up in Alabama. And while I was in that place, God got a hold of my heart. Remember, there was a guy who came through, and he preached out of the book of Matthew, and he said, Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall upon shall be grinded to powder. Of course, we know that stone's the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's true. Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. You've got to be broken to come to God. The only sacrifices that are acceptable to God is a broken spirit and a broken heart and a contrite spirit and a contrite heart. And, 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 and God can't fix anything that's not broken. God can't heal anybody that doesn't need to be healed you got to be broken. Now, the reverse of that is, who, the other side of the coin to that is, whosoever the stone shall fall upon, it shall be grinded to powder. And you don't want to see that side of the stone. It is a scary thing. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But I, I fell on my knees that night, and I said, Lord, I don't know why you want me. Man, I messed up everything. Everything I touch just seems to fall apart, Lord. But if you want me, you can have me. I meant business with the Lord that night and gave my life to him. And it's almost like God has taken my life in counterclockwise motion and all the places I've messed up, all the people I've heard, all the places where I martyred the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's taken me back through all those places and situations and proven himself strong in my life. Those people I used to run around with back in Hawaii, they know God's real because they've seen what he's done in my life. My family knows God's real because they've seen what he's done in my life. He's changed my life, and he can do that for anybody. So I surrendered to go back to Hawaii to be a missionary, and uh, I started, went to Landmark Baptist College, graduated there, 
and uh, began raising support last summer. It was going really slow. Did my first uh, out-of-state missions conference, and a pastor from Hawaii called me and said, how are you going on your support? And I was like, well, about this pace, I'll probably get there in about three years. He's like, man, we need you here yesterday. We just started two churches at our church. We need you to train guys over here. So about a week later, he called me and said, hey, God just put it on my heart to go ahead and take you on for what you need. So it turned into three years. It's turned into three months, and we're leaving now next month to go over there. So pray for us. We, we, <laughs> we're excited. We're chomping at the bit. We've got a lot to do. So we, we covet your prayers. But thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Kevin Akana is a good friend of mine there on the island of Oahu, Windward Baptist Church. And Kevin uh, buried his father. Kevin was pastoring the Windward Church there. And his father was running the banyan tree down at the end of the parking lot where everybody in town would come to buy crystal meth. And so Kevin's trying to win souls over here. And his dad is one of the biggest meth dealers on the island. And uh, that's, the banyan trees are beautiful. If you've been to Hawaii, you know those things are just gorgeous. But that's, that was, Kevin and I would, would jokingly say, that's the Banyan Tree Church. But that's where they'd all come from meth. And a couple of years ago, Kevin buried his father. And uh, through that, one of the largest ministries of that church is drug addiction, drug outreach, because it's such a pandemic over there. And uh, again, I, I, I used to make fun, tease missionaries going to Hawaii and luxury places. But uh, right off the beach, not, not a mile off the beach, the real world is not what the beach world is. Now, Oahu and, and Honolulu and Diamond Head and all that, just people think, oh, party, party, love, love, joy, joy. You come not a mile off that, and you'll find some of the most uh, depressed and difficult people because they have tried all the sex and the drugs and all the life, and they found it to be empty. And uh, we need missionaries, and we need to help them. And then uh, just uh, uh, the cost of living, uh, the price you have to pay, uh, there's a lot to it. People say, oh, they're going to be on permanent vacation. Uh, I promise you it's not like that. Uh, I love to visit. I would love to be there. We, we found that to be one of our favorite places to get away. Uh, and yet you realize the need there is so great because people are either so tuned in to the fun of it or they're so depressed because of the pain of it. In either case, they don't want to hear about Christ. And so it's a very difficult place. Take your Bible and look at 2 Peter chapter 2. And good to meet these two fellows and thank the Lord for them. I want you to remember now what we looked at last week, 2 Peter chapter 1. And we looked at for the last two weeks leading up to tonight uh, the Word of God. And I'll just read verse 19. By the way, uh, I mentioned good to have the girls home. It's good to have our guys home as well. And uh, good to yeah, you pop him right there. Uh, good to have our young men home from college as well. So please, I'm not discriminatory. I just think that girls are more important than guys, and I don't know why that is. But Paul, good to have you. And uh, Paul is doing great up at uh, CSI. CSI, correct? CIS? Huh? See, I knew there was a C in it. CIU, that's in Columbia, South Carolina. And he's had a good first semester. And then Brother Rappersaw's other daughter is here with her husband. And they're down from Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, assistant pastor there at a church in Dearborn. And uh, the world's largest population of Muslims, Dearborn, Mich outside of the Middle East, Dearborn, Michigan. And God has given him a special burden to reach the Muslim world. And uh, so they moved up just this year to be there in that area. And uh, Dearborn has become so... Uh, so covered in the Muslim faith and in the, the Muslim practice that you'll hear call to prayer played loudly uh, throughout the city. And just uh, we have some dear friends there in that region. We appreciate uh, these guys visiting their home for the holidays. And mom and dad, they don't care one bit that they're here, but they're glad that grandbaby's down. Amen. And uh, so praise the Lord. All right, look with me now. Verse number 19 of chapter 1. And then we'll begin chapter 2 together. I'll read verses 19, 20, and 21. And then we're going to break down the chapter. So I'll not try to read it for the sake of time, but read it as we cover it. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is, in a, uh, is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost now the word of God is pure the word of God is perfect it's preserved it's all those things 
But the chapter divisions are not the Word of God. They were put there later by men to help us in study and reading and finding our place. And so really, we have this great truth about the strength and purity and the perfect Word of God. And then we go into the next thought of chapter 2, verse 1. But really, chapter 2, verse 1 is a continuation of what we just talked about. Here we have the Word of God. Here's the Word of God, where we ought to get our doctrine, our faith, our practice. Uh, We ought to live by it. We ought to go by every word that it said. And uh, so we have that. And then immediately he says, now wait a minute. Beware, because there's false teachers. Now how do you know whether a teacher is a false teacher or not? And the answer is referring back to chapter 1. You know by the Word of God. Uh, Don't you think there it would be important for us to know the Word of God? So that not only do we know what we're learning, but we know how to discern and tell if someone is teaching false doctrine. And so we go right into chapter number 2, verse 1, and he says, now listen. And by the way, this is Peter. This is still right after Christ. These are just a few years after the birth of the church. And he says, now wait a minute. There already are false teachers present with us. Now mark it down. Some 2,000 years later, I promise you there are a lot of false teachers present with us. And you be careful. Not everybody who claims to be a preacher or a teacher or a man of God or even a woman of God in some cases, not everybody who writes a book that's sold at the Christian bookstore, not everybody on the internet, not everybody on the radio is somebody you ought to give credence to. A lot of false teaching. Say, Brother Stansel, I know how to tell if it's a false teacher. You tell me and I'll know. That's not good enough. Because I'll not always be with you. Well, my daddy said, no, not good enough. You need to learn the word of God for yourself. So that when you hear something, you say, now, wait a minute. Uh, Not only is that not what I've been taught, but that's not what I've read and studied in the word of God. Because there's a lot of false teachers out there. May I make a statement to you that I think is a wonderful statement? It wasn't my statement. It was made by Dr. Barber. Dr. Barber said there never would have been a charismatic movement had the Baptists not joined in. Uh, There never would have been a growth in the Mormon church or the Jehovah's Witness or the other cults that we know are not uh, true gospel, uh, local New Testament churches. There never would have been a boom in these other cults had Baptists not left the faith and joined. So what happened, preacher? Here's what happened. We have raised, now I, I speak this to our shame, we have raised a generation of illiterate Bible believers. They don't know what they believe. We have raised a generation that knows a lot about everything else. But the one thing we ought to know the most about and ought to be the sharpest in is the one thing we know the least about, and that's the Word of God. The presence of false teachers. I'm shocked, saddened, and amazed when people come up to me and say, Hey, Brother Stanislaw, I was listening to, and then they named somebody, and my first thought is, Why in God's name would you waste a minute of your precious life listening to that apostate? Now, I wouldn't name a name. I wouldn't call any. Listen, but there are just some people that when you listen to them, you're not listening to a Bible preacher. And let me give you a little thought. They don't wear a sign that says, I'm not a Bible preacher. They claim to be a Bible preacher. They claim to be a man of God. Uh, They claim to be a a teacher of of the Word of God. And you say, well, Brother Stencil, they're on the Christian television program. If you think everything on the Christian TV program is Christian, I would like to sell you much land I do not own. <laughs> well, Brother Stansel, they were on uh, Joy FM, or they were on Moody, or they were on... Listen, it doesn't matter. Uh, money can buy you airtime on almost anything. Dr. Harry Carr was a professor of mine in Bible college. He's one of the great men that influenced my life and really is the man who probably did more than any other man to teach me the importance of Bible doctrine. I was raised in a church where the evangelism was the thrust and the bus ministry was a thrust. And it was go, 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 win, win, win. We didn't spend a lot of time in doctrine. In fact, we would say things like, God save us from theologians. 
God save us from these doctors who spend all their time studying. But it was Dr. Carr that began to teach me that if you don't have a foundation of what you believe, when you go out, you'll be not equipped well to present the gospel. Dr. Carr said, I pastored, and before he became an independent Baptist preacher, for about 25 or 30 years of his ministry, he was a pastor in the Social Brethren Church. Some of you maybe know the social brother in a lot of uh, southern Illinois and some of the rural Kentucky areas. And he was a circuit riding uh, brethren pastor. He would pastor four churches, one a Sunday. You only went to church once a month. Say amen right there. Some of you are thinking maybe we could join the social brother. But Brother Carr said he was in one of his churches, and, and uh, uh, he inherited the church and became the pastor. And he said, uh, I, I was just going through the classes one day, and, and I began to, to listen to one of our little old ladies teach the Bible to the children. And she was one of the children's teachers, and she said, class, he, he, he told our class, he said, fellas, he said she'd been a member of that church for years and years and years and years. She taught the Sunday school class for years and years and years and years. He said, I just began to listen to what she was teaching the class. And he said, fellas, here I was pastoring what I thought to be a Bible church. And, and grandma, and he named her name, and I don't remember her name. He said, but grandma was teaching Mormon doctrine to our children in the Sunday school classes. See, it's not just out there. It's in here. And I, I'm just going to mention this and move on. We have some strange people come through here. With some strange philosophies. And, 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 and again, they don't all wear a sign that says, I should be in a home somewhere. <laughs> we have some strange independent Baptist philosophies. We have some fellows trying to take a, a church that is free in the grace of God and bring us back into bondage by rules made by men. And they're good men, and we love them, and thank God for the good things. But listen, not everybody ought to be listened to. Everybody ought to be judged according to what the Word of God says. Remember last week I made a statement in preaching, be careful of a man who elevates his preferences above the clear teaching of the Word of God. There's false teachers, and they're not all just bad out there. Sometimes they sneak in here. That's why we're very careful about uh, who we bring in. Uh, Brother Hart was able to come because of uh, Brother Paul's recommendation and the history there. And Brother Joe was able to come because of Brother Keith. That almost got him out, but we let him in. And uh, Brother Mark and others. But you say, Pastor, why are you careful? Because just because they come from another circle of independent matters doesn't mean that we need to be listening to them. Now, number one, let me get the presence of false teachers. Number two, let me hasten and say this. Verse number one, the Bible deals with the presence of false teachers teaching damnable heresies, denying the Lord. Listen, one of the keys to a false teacher is, is he right or wrong on salvation? If he adds anything to salvation, if he changes anything about the grace of God given to men who believe in God. And we went through this, and I'll not take time, but we went through this for several years in our movement where we wrestled. How much repentance is enough repentance? How much faith is enough faith? Listen, here's the clear definition of salvation. You're lost. You recognize Christ can save. You turn from your sin to receive Christ. It's nothing more or less. You can't feel more sorry than sorry. We try to add all this cumbersome mess to salvation where you've got to name every sin. Listen, I can't name every sin from the weekend, much less my lifetime. If you're wrong on salvation, be careful. There are probably nothing else you want to hear from that first person. But then it goes on to say, many shall follow their per pernicious ways. That word means destructive or damnable ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now look at verse number 3. God said, I'm going to deal with false teachers. I want you to see the punishment of false teachers. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. God says, I am going to deal with them. It may not be in your timetable, but I will deal with them. Then he says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell... And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. 
delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelt among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. I want you to notice just a couple of things quickly. Examples of punishment. God says, if you think I'm going to spare these false teachers, let me remind you those angels that rebelled, I dealt with them. And those that rebelled in that Andalusian time before the flood, those that had turned their back on God, lived like there was no God. He said, I judge them. And he said, let me give you a personal illustration. Uh, I dealt with the nation or the land, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I burnt them with fire, left nothing but ashes. He said, I will deal with all those that do wrong. And I, I just wonder this, and just a thought is there a greater punishment for someone who would deceitfully handle the Word of God? To willfully and knowingly deceive others using the Word of God for their own end and their own gain. I believe that there could be no greater thing in the world than to willfully misuse the Word of God for your own good. That's why these that have so betrayed the confidence of a nation and have so betrayed the confidence of their churches and so betrayed those who have listened to them hoping to hear the truth of the Word of God, I believe that the judgment they'll face is far greater than anything we could ever do to them because there's nothing more important than a man's eternity. But I want you to notice an example. But at number two, I want you to notice an explanation. Lot was spared. Lot was spared. You say, Brother Sansel, Lot was wrong. And Lot was wrong. Lot looked towards Sodom. He leaned towards Sodom. He moved in and lived in Sodom. And the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul daily with the conversation of the wicked. Lot was a bad guy. Lot had done some bad things. But Lot was a believer who was so influenced by the things of the world. Yet Lot, the Bible says, was a righteous man. There is a difference between those who deceitfully do wrong and those who find themselves doing wrong as someone who has given themselves into temptation. I was listening to your testimony. I said, if you just put Air Force instead of Navy, and if you put Panama City in front of Oahu, we live the same life, basically. And, and, and you know, something interesting to me, even in my worst days and in, in my, my horrible de decision at that time, you know, there was still a fire in my bosom. There was still a uh, knowledge in my heart. There was a truth. There was still an understanding that, that people around me needed to be saved. And, and I remember I wasn't able to do it because of my lifestyle, but I would still try to encourage people to church and, and try to tell them right from wrong. You say, man, you were the pot calling the kettle black. Yes, I was in there, but there was something inside of me saying, what I'm doing is wrong and you you don't want to die without Christ. I believe Lot, as he vexed his righteous soul, I believe just as we do sometimes, we enjoy the pleasures of sin, but he realized this is not right, and, and this is not truth, and what I'm doing is going to cost me, and by the way, it did cost him. It cost him everything. It cost him his life, his wife, his family, and yet in his wicked living, there was still something inside of him saying, this is wrong. Now listen, the difference between a false teacher and a deceiver is he knows it's wrong, but listen, he doesn't care it's wrong. He's willfully using the word of God for his own gain. That's why Lot wasn't punished with Sodom and Gomorrah, the men there of that city. Uh, he was spared from there. But I want you to notice quickly now the evidence of their false teaching. Look at verse number 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise government, presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. God says, I'm going to tell you who I'm going to deal with. I'm going to show you the fruit of a false teacher. Number one, those who walk after the flesh. These are those that take the things of God that he says are clearly wrong and things not to be touched, things to be messed with. And these are those that say, oh, no, that's okay. Oh, listen, I know what the Bible says, but listen, the Bible was written a long time ago. It doesn't apply to us now. Do what you want to do. You have liberty. They've taken the liberty, the grace of God, and turned it into lasciviousness. Walk after the flesh. 
You know, a lot of Bible teachers, you listen to them, you're thinking, what Bible are you teaching? Do you know there used to be a time when wrong was wrong and right was right? You go to a lot of churches now and the lines are so blurred. No wonder America has no spiritual uh, temperature because America's pastors have no passion in the pulpit. We used to have no problem preaching. And by the way, we still don't. We used to have no problem talking about not sins in a generic term, but naming sins. The average Christian broadcast will do well if it mentions sin in a collective form. But you listen clearly. The average Christian broadcast will never be specific. In fact, we've come to the place where some of our new evangelical friends are saying things that we used to say were dead wrong. They're now apologizing that we used to preach that way. Now, I understand, and again, let's, let's be careful. I understand preferences and personal convictions. But, but I don't think alcohol is a personal preference. I believe it's a p- clear Bible principle. So, Brother Sands, I think you can just have a social drink. There is not one positive thing said in the Bible about alcohol unless you're dying. And then it's used simply as a narcotic to ease your pain. So if you're dying, bye-bye. But other than that, stay away from it. I'm, I'm okay. I thought about it. And then I'm, I, miss, I miss that a lot. Y'all know that I miss that. But I'm scared to death now. I, I don't want to break anything else. You know, we used to talk about flirting and relationships outside of marriage. We, we used to, I mean, we used to tell our teenagers, don't you even touch her. If you grew up in a Baptist church, you had a six-sense rule enforced by everybody in the church. If you will do what you do in front of me in the pulpit, God knows what you're going to do when I'm not around. God knows what you'll do when your parents aren't around. No wonder, no wonder we don't blush anymore at sin. Used to, now listen, I, I love all of our little mommies who, who, who have babies. We love babies around here. Uh, but there used to be a time that if you got pregnant out of wedlock, it was a shame. Now we walk around like it's no big deal. By the way, once it happens, there's forgiveness, restoration. We move forward. But I promise you this, we will never stop telling our children that the best way to get married, the only way God promotes to get married is the pure way. We used to preach against things that now we have found to be acceptable to the point where some of our youth pastors act more like the world than they do the church. Because, you know, we got to reach this generation. We lost this generation a long time ago when we started trying to reach this generation with the world's methods. Well, pastor, you can't get tears to come. Hey, we had a hundred and something kids over here. We're doing something right. And by the way, Brother Paul has found... A secret place that we can't tell nobody about. But I think we're going to double wow in about two or three weeks. Because he's found the little honey hole we're going to fish in this week. Hey, there is a way to do it. It's just the Bible way. The churches today. Listen, God is my witness. I'm not a mad person. I'm a fundamentalist but not mad about it. But I, I saw a guy. He's a leading contemporary pastor. He tweeted today, do not miss worship at. And he named his church. He said, the I Phone, iPod, band will kick off our worship. They had a picture. So, of course, I got to go see what it looks like. So I click on it. And there's six guys. I mean, literally looks like, looks like a, a concert from some, some rock band. And they've all got their little phones. And they're going to play the music. And y'all know what I'm talking about. You've seen that. They're all going to play. That's going to kick off worship. Listen, if that is worship. Uh, the Bible says we've profane the holy things. Friend, I think that's a perfect example of profaning the holy things when we bring the world's mindset and the world's methodology into our worship services. And you know me. Listen, I'm not against trying things. I'm I'm not against opening the door. But we will not. We cannot make the lust of the flesh the primary goal. If you please men with the flesh, you must keep men with the flesh. And these false teachers... Oh, but Brother Chancellor, they're running 10,000. I just watched the NFL football this afternoon. They fill 50, 60,000 people in a stadium over the weekend. It doesn't mean they're successful in God's eyes. Large churches with big influences, large crowds are not the, re, are, are not the, the uh, 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 
they're not the, the point in which you choose whether or not someone was a success. The world has always outdrawn the church. And let me just be real clear. The world will always outdraw the church. Oh, but Brother Sester, if you're going to be big, you got to do this. Big is not the goal. God is the goal. So they walk after the flesh. Number two, notice, notice verse number 10. Not only do they walk after the flesh, but the Bible says, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Now, I'll not go far in this. This is not a, a time to break this all the way down. But the lust of uncleanness here, this is not just sexual sin. This is not just fornication. This is not just adultery. This is the sin of, of what Romans describes, the unnatural use of a man and a woman. I, I, I'm so careful to preach stuff like this anymore because the way that we broadcast everything, you can take a clip out of context and you can turn us into a bunch of monsters. But, but let me just say this. The attitude America has taken to the sin of sodomy and homosexual, homosexuality is, in my opinion, the last step in our slide. When we say what God has called an abomination is now perfectly acceptable as a nation from the highest office in the land. We've always had it. You know that, right? Here's the difference. We've always had it, but we've never accepted it. This generation and the generations right before us have now accepted it to listen. Your children's children will not know the difference. In my, I'm 44 years old. In my lifetime as a young man, up until just a few years ago, if I saw someone practicing that kind of attitude and lifestyle, it was a rare phenomenon. This week, Friday night, my wife and I went out finally for a little date, first time in a forever time. Went out for a little date, and, and here we are at our little table, and here they are at their little table, and here they are at their little table. Listen, it is as normal as the nose on your face now. It's taught Again, not, not an attack on anybody. I, I wouldn't do that to you for anything in the world. But, but the idea that you're getting an education at a public school is a farce. You're not getting an education. You're getting an indoctrination. Our military has now become a testing ground for all kinds. They're now performing same-sex marriages on our military bases. Now, I'm not, listen, I love, you, you know our stand on that. Anybody here is welcome. We love everybody. I, I have some dear friends that are involved in that. I don't have a problem loving them, but I do have a problem telling them that what they are doing is okay in the sight of God. We, we've so gone over the deep end, and we have churches that say, oh, that's okay. Oh, those old timers. Those old, those fundamentalists. Boy, if we could just get rid of all those fundamentalists, they're the ones that's holding back progress. Dear friend, this is not progress. This is false doctrine. This is false teaching. This is destroying the fabric of our homes. And as our homes are destroyed, our churches are destroyed. And as our churches are destroyed, our nation is destroyed. The lust of uncleanness. Number three, <clears throat> letter C, if you're taking notes, verse 10 not only do we notice them by their desire to walk after the flesh, the things of the flesh, the lust of uncleanness, the, the acceptance of things that God calls an abomination. But in verse 10, he says, they despise government. Now, listen, I despise much about our current government. But this is not what that verse talks about. What this verse is talking about is they despise God's ordained authority. Now, let me explain very clearly. There are three governments that God has ordained. Number one, he ordained the home. Right. Number two, he ordained the government or the civil government, which is our governors and our civil magistrates and those that are to keep us safe. That's their main job. And then number three, the church government, the local church. That's the three institutions. That's the three governments. And every part of your life is under one of those governments. Well, Brother Sansa, we just don't believe in join in no church. We'll come and we'll attend, but we ain't going to join no church. You know why? Because this is a sign of the last days. People don't want any 
authority in their life. Oh, Brother Stan, so, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want no mama and we're going to sue our parents because we don't like the way they're raising us. Oh, Brother Stan, so, uh, no government, anarchy. Listen, God ordained government. We're not anarchists. We, we, can, we can be against the teachings or the doctrines, philosophies of our government. We can be good citizens. We can do it in the right way. Uh, but listen, government is ordained of God and is God's instrument in our life. By the way, America is, is the last great hope, but a lot of our brethren already live in socialistic countries. Just because America becomes a socialistic country doesn't mean that we still don't have a responsibility to obey God when it comes to government. Australia has been gone forever. You, you don't have the privileges we have here. Social medicine is your norm there. You can still live for Christ. By the way, the first church was under Roman rule. Do you want to go there? Just because America has been so blessed, it's not the end of the world, church. We're just going to have to become what the rest of the world already is, and that's a church under persecution. And by the way, we're joining that club quickly. But we live in a world where nobody wants authority. And then you got these false teachers come along saying, yeah, you don't have to have. No, no, that old time pastor, that that bishop, that shepherd, that overseer. No, that's an old term. But listen, I'm going to be your buddy. I'm going to be, I'm not going to wear a tie. I'm not going to wear a suit. Because, you know, that represents authority. We're not going to have structure. We're not going to have church bylaws and constitution. No, man, we're just going to come worship and leave. Listen, God ordained structure in your life because you and I need structure in our life. I'm not going to join. I'll just come. I don't, the family, that whole, by the way, that whole wife taking the man's name thing, we're not going to do I'm going to keep my own name. I'm not going to submit to any authority. By the way, when you don't submit to authority, don't expect your children to submit to authority. They despise government. We live in a world where, where rules, we, I, I was reading, this is 10, oh my goodness, this is longer than that, this is, 13, 14 years ago, and I was reading some pastors, and not, not independent guys, just, just in the evangelical world. And they said, we are having the hardest time getting people to join a church. We, we just can't understand why people won't join church. They want to attend, but they, you know why? Because they don't want to be counted on. They don't want to be start part of the core. They don't want to be part of the backbone. They don't want authority. They despise government. They despise rules. They despise someone having uh, supposed control. Then number four, or letter D. Not only do they despise government, but verse 10 says they're presumptuous. Presumptuous, bold, daring, not fearing to speak against men of the most exalted character and even God himself. You know, I... I I used, to, I used to live in a world where policemen were called policemen. I used to live in a world where you respected the pastor. I used to live in a world where you were kind of afraid to go against authority. And, and my God, in our house, if you would have said anything but yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, you could pick your teeth up on the other side of the room. Now, I love you dearly. And I'm not mad. Listen, if you think I'm mad, I'm not mad. I'm not upset. But if my children talked to me the way some of your children talk to you, we would have a come to Jesus meeting right there. You say, brother, that's what they'll call CPS. I will have them until CPS shows up. Don't parents letting their children treat them like they're hired help. Now, let me help. Let me help you. Well, brother, says, I just can't control my four-year-olds. You're a grown man. For God's sake, you ought to be able to control a child. Well, you know, my teenager's out of control. Look, put your teenager in a... Put your, I'll help you with your dad. I can help you. Your teenager wants to be the boss of his own life. Put all that he owns in a suitcase and put him on a bus or a plane to the roll-off homes or to some of these other places like that. He'll love home after a week or two. Oh, brother, say, you don't love your... I love my children enough not to let them get away with treating me like hired help. Yeah, I, I, I promise you, daddies, if you don't have any more respect for yourself, at least have some respect for the wife that bore those children to you. 
letting your children talk to that woman who went to the jaws of death to bring them in this world. Let them talk to her like she's some kind of slave or maid. God help you daddies to have no more sense than that. You're, you're pitiful. You ain't a man. You ain't got no more gump in the world than to let your children disrespect their mama. No, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the spirit. Oh, hey. Yeah. We may be in the spirit, out of spirit. I cannot tell, but I'm having a wonderful time. Because <laughs> I'm embarrassed for you. I'm embarrassed for you to be a Christian and your home be so dysfunctional because you're raising. By the way, you know why you're raising presumptuous children? The way you talk about your pastor. The way you talk about Brother Paul. The way you talk about Brother Tyler. You know where they learn that from? It's a modeled behavior, dear friend. You eat your pastor for lunch. No wonder they ain't got no respect for you. You don't have any respect for the people in your authority. Presumptuous. I, I hardly, my, my wife cannot take me to the mall anymore because I just feel like I ought to open a kiosk in the middle of the mall called Spankings for a Dollar. I will pay you a dollar to let you let me spank. I, listen, if it wasn't for them boys in Texas that have been in prison the last 15 years for spanking some children in their church, we, we'd have a spanking time. But we, we, we will not, I'll never spank anybody's children of mine because I'm not going to go to jail. I'm way too pretty to go to jail. <laughs> but, but, but listen, this, this, this sass, this little arrogant, presumptuous attitude, yeah. And no. Oh, no, ma'am. Your little children come and say, yeah. You, I, I say, no, ma'am. You say, yes, sir. And they look at me like it's the first time they've ever heard that. You know why? That's probably the first time they've ever heard it. Now, this is home training 101. By the way, let me just say this. Dr. Davis is coming in February. We're doing a family. I'm paying the bill to do a family conference. Dr. Davis is coming. We're going to do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day. If you don't get yourself to that family conference, don't you dare come to me complaining why your family is not the way it ought to be. Because he will do far more for good for you than I can possibly do tonight. But we are trying our best to help our families because we're worried about where our families are headed. Presumptuous. Boy, this turned into a hallelujah service, didn't it? This camp meeting right here. Woo! Letter E. Yeah, we're just going to finish now because I'm, I'm done here. Letter E. They're self-willed. You know what's wrong with most of us? We'd rather please ourselves than please a holy God. We'd rather please ourselves than meet the need of our spouse. We'd rather please ourselves than meet the need of our children. We'd rather please ourselves than help our parents. We are the most spoiled, rotten, selfish people I think I've ever seen. I, I go to Costa Rica. I go to Haiti. I go to these other countries. And, and I see what these children have. And then I hear our own children talk about what they want. And I'm thinking, oh, my word. I want the latest this and the latest that. And, Oh, my iPhone broke, and oh, I got to have this, and I lost my brand new this, and I lost my brand new that. All about us. It's me, my, I. Used to, it was him. It was others. If you ever got to yourself, you were last on the list. Now we've jumped clear to the front of the line. Self willed. Children, be a little bit grateful. Could, could you just pretend to be grateful? Oh, I love Thanksgiving. Oh, Brother Stanley, I want to give thanks. Oh, Thanksgiving service was so sweet. And then Thursday we have Thanksgiving. And Friday we have Black Friday because we've got to get some more stuff to be thankful for. By the way, Black Friday is now Thursday night. By the way, next year, Black Friday will be Thursday morning. By the way, I'd never heard of this until a couple years ago, but Black Friday is now followed by Cyber Monday. It's just crazy. Abraham Lincoln said, let's set aside a day for prayer and thanksgiving to God. Prayer and fasting, thanksgiving. Consumerism says, let's forget thanksgiving. Let's get some more stuff that we can't afford in this thing in first place to ungrateful, wretched children who don't even deserve what we're pouring on them. Now, y'all think I'm Scrooge, and I am. Because it's pitiful. An ungrateful, by the way, sign of the last time, unthankful, self-willed. And then number five here, or number six, 
number, whatever you want it to be. I don't care. Letter F. He says, and not evil, or not afraid to speak evil of dignities. These false teachers have, have so taught and so infiltrated our thinking that we're not afraid to speak even against God, the scriptures, the pastor, the people in authority. We're not afraid. No, I, and I've heard, I have, this, this is so funny. It's ironic, funny, not funny, ha ha, funny. But I've heard people say this. Well, Brother Hansel, you may preach that, but now we don't really believe that. If I preach it, it's Bible. People laugh, and, they, and I, I laugh with them because there's nothing I can do to change their mind. I can't make people do right. But people laughingly say things like, well, you know, we know what we're supposed to do, but we're going to do whatever we want to do anyway. <laughs> what? And, 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 uh, why, why do you, listen, let me help you. Why do you think people leave their country and go, to the worst mission field in the world, as far, as far as just longevity goes. I'm, I don't know. There's always worse mission fields. But why would people leave their country and, and leave their home and leave their family and go around the globe to a place that doesn't want them to come in the first place? They're trying to help those people know Christ and help those people have a life worth living. Why would those people go to, oh, we're going to go on vacation? No, they're going to go and try to give their life to, to save a culture that's dominated by paganism and all the polytheism of the Eastern world and, and the drug addiction and try to help those people who are so despondent like Brother Hart was. Brother says, why do you do what you do? Oh, it, it's for the glamorous lifestyle. Oh, it's for, the, it's for all the, the joy and the, it's for, for the, the offshore bank accounts. And, no. We do what we do because for God's sake, we're trying to get you ready to give an account to God. We're trying to keep your family. I, I, I'm, I'm so amazed. And I, I, just, I just look on Facebook, people that were in church and faithful and Sunday school teachers and, and, and just people that I looked up to now 10, 15, 20 years later, divorced, out of church, in the world. Their children are gone to the dogs. Their children are a mess. You say, Pastor, what are you doing? I'm trying to keep you from wrecking your life. I get no joy out of preaching hard, man. I get no joy out of trying to help you to be a good parent. I get no joy out of confronting you with the truth that you ought to do right and try to be the family that you ought to be and the husband and the mother and the child. I don't run around looking for new things to preach to you about, but I'm doing my best to preach verse by verse the whole counsel of God so that you'll be a perfect, thoroughly finished man or woman of God that when you die, you'll be ready to give an account of yourself to God. And then you're like, well, that's just Brother Stansel. You know, you know I'll stop here because I've got more. I'll stop. It's amazing that pastors average lifespan four to six years. It's amazing average youth pastor less than two years. You, you know, one of the, and I, there's a lot of reasons I know. But, but I really believe that one of the reasons that the average pastor stays four to six years is because after a while, he's tired of preaching to the pew. Because the pew is listening as well as some of the people. Now, this church right now, let me just turn the table just a moment for you. This church right now is on a spiritual rush. We, we've, had, we've had two, three months here that, that I wouldn't trade for anything. We've seen people saved and baptized. Brother Dan said we had almost 350 just adults this morning in this room, not counting any of the children's ministries or anything outside this room. I mean, we're, we're, having, a, we're having a wonderful run right now. Say, listen, you baptize on Friday, you're having a good day. When you've got to come into work to baptize because she wants to get baptized right now, that's a good day. And seeing some of these young men and women surrendering themselves and growing, and, and, and that, that absolutely fires you up and keeps you motivated. But I want to tell you something. Listen, as good as it is right now for us, we are the exception, not the norm in Baptist churches. In the 70s, the largest churches in America across the board, something like 48 out of the 50 states were independent Baptist church. Now there's only one, and because of some recent turmoil, it's on the decline. Baptist churches are not making an impact like we were 25, 30 years ago. It's just not happening. And you guys that have been on deputation, and you guys that have been on deputation, little pockets, little pockets, little pockets. 
If you are going to have God's blessing in your life, listen, you are going to hear the word of God, you are going to respond to the word of God, and you are going to apply the word of God. When I first came, and we're just talking here now as family, I'm done I'm just giving you a little pastoral love. When I first came to our church, what, what, three years ago now, three and a half years ago now, I'd preach and there'd be one or two people at the altar. Last week I preached, and from door to door, it was full into the doubles and triples. And Brother Dory came over to me and said, Brother Stansel, I want you to look at the altar call. I said, yeah, it's great. He said, no, no, you, you got to look. Now, again, four years ago, a handful of people using the altars. Now, last week, from wall to wall, door to door, full and doubles and back. Brother Dory said, no, you got to look. And I said, what? what? I thought, Brother Dory, you, you, what are you trying to say? He said, look. He said, they're all men. There were two ladies, I believe there were two ladies here, but the rest was wall-to-wall young men. Look at our choir, two-to-one men. I'm telling you, the key to where we're going right now is verse-by-verse preaching this book. Verse-by-verse. I'm trying to preach through 2 Peter. We're trying to preach through Hebrews. And we'll start a brand new series come January on our new theme, which we'll unveil first week of January. And we'll preach through that book. But verse by verse, the preaching of God's word. But I can preach God's word. It's up to you to respond to it. If God touches your heart, don't you dare wait. Don't you let that... That, that sin lay dormant. You confess it. You move forward quickly. You let this Bible stay hot in your life. You let what God's doing right now permeate your life. Don't you buy into this false teaching that you don't have to be an old-time Christian. The Bible's an old-time Christian book. And the only way to stay, there's no shortcut. We, we can't just throw up a rock concert and, and have God's blessing. We've got to pray and fast. We've got to win souls and stay true to this book. And, and, and there's no shortcut to it. But the blessing is it's real and it lasts. And it's not some flash in the pan here for a moment and then vanishes away. These, these, these churches are all around him. And we're not enemies of false churches. I mean, of, of, of other churches. We love other churches. We are enemies of false churches. And just because a guy down the road does it a little bit differently, we're, we're not looking for them. I don't care. Listen, to be honest, I don't care what anybody else does or how they do. I don't know. I'm here every week. Some of you that bounce around, you come and tell me. But other than that, I don't know. But I said, you know what you're doing up the road? How would I have been here for the last three and a half years? I've always thought, I'm just going to take a week's vacation, just go visit other churches so I know what you're listening to. But we've just got to keep focused on this book and, and, and may I say this, it's not the preacher of this book, it's this book. Yes, sir. If Dan's up here, you say, well, Brother Dan's not you, Pastor. Nobody's me. That's why God made me me. I like me. Brother Paul's up here. Brother Tyler's up here. Brother Mark's up here. I don't care who's up here. If they open this book, you give attention and reverence to what that book has to say. And, and, and listen, I won't say that. If I'm not here and you know I'm not going to be here and you don't come, God have mercy on you for that. Because that's teaching your children it's the man, not the book. And that, that's going to hurt them years later. That's really going to hurt them years later. Because they're going to fall in love with the personality. And listen, man will always hurt you. Man will always disappoint you. This book will never disappoint you. Some of you are just now getting over disappointments because you had so much hope in a man. That man dropped the ball and ruined your life. Listen, I don't care what man does. The Bible never fails. The Bible never fails. It's not my preaching. It's not our guest preachers. It's not our evangelists. It's not our program. It's the preaching and the adhering to this book. Bible Institute, we have over 50. To God's glory, we have over 50 enrolled in the Bible Institute Almost 50 enrolled in the Bible suit for this next semester. We, we've had 30 or so every week for the last few weeks in RU learning the Bible, teaching the Bible. Our Sunday schools are growing because we're teaching the Bible. This is our theme. This is our key. Don't be distracted by other things you hear or what others are doing. Stay focused on the Word of God and let that be your guide. Learn it. Get it down in your, so the moment you hear it, you go, that ain't right. Yeah. 
Now, that, 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 that sounds good, looks good, but that ain't right. I don't have to listen to two minutes of a preacher to know whether he's preaching the word or whether he's preaching. For, and I'll, I'll finish this thought next week. I'll show you what they do and how they do it. But, but I can listen for two or three minutes. If a program is on for 30 minutes and 28 minutes of it is the offering, you may have a problem. Just a little note there. If there's more excitement about the Holy Spirit than Christ who died on Calvary, you may have a problem there. Now, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity, but the Holy Spirit's job is to point man to the cross. So much more. Father, I'm, bur- I'm, I'm not just burdened. I'm flat tore up that so many of our people have such little hunger and little regard for the Word of God. I know it's a, in our own family we we try to make sure our kids are reading and saying we, we can't make them. We can't make them do what they will not do. But, Lord, I pray you'd help our people to love this book, to learn this book, the principles of it. Rightly divide the word of truth, line upon line, precept upon precept. And, God, I pray tonight that you just stir us. Uh, Lord, I pray for those that uh, are unsure of what they believe. May they not count on what others say but what this book says. Lord, I pray you'd keep us going in the right direction. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, if I change tomorrow, God, help me never to, but if I change tomorrow, begin to preach a a damnable heresy or a false doctrine, may the men and women of this church rise up in love but in strength and say, no, pastor, it's the Bible, not you. It's the word, it's the precept, it's it's the principles of the word of God, not your personality, not your teaching. The Bible will stay, but you must go. May that be the case. So many good churches ruined because people got lost in a person or a program and not the precepts of the Word of God. Lord, I pray you're blessed tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. If you need to make a decision this evening, God's speaking to you. Maybe you need to come and and just solidify what God is doing. Perhaps you need to join the church or present yourself for baptism or another decision. I don't know what it may be. We'll open the altars. Folks are here to pray with you, to help you. Whatever your need may be, listen, a hunger, a thirst for the Word of God. May it be the principle for you. If you have a need tonight, you come. Our men are here. Our staff is available. Sunday school teacher, may I help you tonight? Teach the Word of God in your class. Children's program directors, workers, may I encourage you? The Word of God. Bible study groups, the Word of God. Listen, there's time for other things, but when it comes time for the teaching, it's time for the Word of God. Mark will sing a verse. You step out of your place. Teachers teach it. Preachers preach it.
seated just a moment. Uh, men, you come while they're making their way. Let me remind you that Tuesday uh, we have our breakfast club at Tyrone Chick-fil-A. If you want to join us for a great time, great food, and uh, we enjoy a time of Bible study and prayer there. Tuesday morning, 930 and then this week is our Christmas parties, our birthday parties for Jesus, uh, 226 ministry at 7 o'clock, teens at 7 o'clock, and a lot going on. Dorcas meets this week. Uh, Sally House Outreach, we had a group go down yesterday, and uh, we have another one the 22nd. And so some of that's coming up, pay, may, make a note of that. And then also let me say uh, just a couple of things about uh, the uh, ministry involvement night. If you've been asked to be at that meeting uh, just in the West Wing, for those that have been asked to be a part of ministry involvement night, we need to have a quick meeting about that. And they were also asking for church members to help us with the bus program, sponsoring the book done into every bus home for Christmas, a gift from our church to the parents uh, so they can hear and see the gospel and also a gift for the children. And then we'll take an offering, our Christmas offering. Uh, every year we take an offering and just dedicate it to something. And this year will be our children's ministry to help offset the cost of that. And then, ladies, can you please, please, please help us with meals for the Dollins this week? Uh, little Drew, nine pounds, five and a half ounces. Uh, if you can help us, if you can't help make a meal, but you'd like to sponsor a meal, uh, we'll go buy it. And if you could just pay for it, if you want to do that, see Miss Julie uh, or uh, any of our office people, Brother Paul, myself. And then uh, we have also a uh, nursing home is collecting uh, special donations for gifts in some of our nursing home ministries. See Miss Cindy or Kim Richmond, if you would, about that. All right. Uh, time for the offering. God bless you as you give. Father, bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Rachel Hart is one of the most talented ladies in our church. She has such a beautiful voice and then plays the flute for us. What a blessing. Uh, I want you to come next Sunday night. We're going to have a candlelight service. I've never done one. In all our years of ministry, we've never had a candlelight service. So next Sunday night, Brother Dory's son-in-law will be here, and he'll be providing special music and just kind of a neat uh, Christmas Eve, Eve service. And uh, we look forward to that. And uh, while I was sitting there thinking, I, I, I just had one more thought. I, I'm not going to preach anything else, but I did have a thought. Let me share it with you. Be careful who you let around your children. I don't care if it's grandma, grandpa, or a friend, or somebody else. Negative spirits toward the men of God, and the people of God, and the house of God, and things of God. I don't care where it comes from. It affects your children. You say, well, pastor, we're old friends. Don't let it affect your children. You know, people that are negative 
look to spread negativity. And we're talking about, you know, just they're willing to say anything. Your children don't hear that. And be careful who you let influence your children because uh, before long you'll wonder, where's that spirit of rebellion coming from? And it's being fostered because of the people we are allow. And, and I, I, we're careful, and, and, and like you know all the little girls, they run together. We, we, we're, we're guarding again. We want to help your children, help our children. Uh, but uh, just be careful. Be, be very wary about that. I say that because we're going into the Christmas season and you'll be around family and all that. Just be sensitive to everything that's going on around your children. That's your most precious commodity. And uh, guard that with all your heart. Brother Hart and his precious wife back here, uh, all you Bible Baptist folks that have history there, you go back and spend some time. And uh, Brother Joe and his family, uh, we're so thankful that they're here. And uh, get to meet these good missionaries. And Brother David, you get with them. Let's find out what their needs are. And then uh, other than that, spend some time together. Uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, RU, 7 o'clock, Thursday night. Uh, all the activities, uh, Bible club, not this week because we're out of school, right? Or we have Bible club. This is our last week of Bible club. Uh, did I mention 12 kids saved in Bible club this week? 14 kids saved. In. So Bible club, Bible club on Tuesday, Bible club on Thursday, Bible club on Friday. So you pray for our teams as they go out. And then, wow, uh, we had 110, I think, on the buses Wednesday night, and that was down from the week before. We had 118 uh, or 130, so I don't know. We had a lot, and uh, they keep telling me. Now, listen, I'm just going to tell the church this. I've told our 226 workers, if you have more kids in the bus ministry than we have adults in the Bible study, we'll swap rooms because you need the room and we don't, and they've taken that as kind of a challenge that they'd love to run us over to the small room and they have the big room. Then they could divide up into three groups and uh, do three different programs. And they've kind of got excited about that. So if we do not bring more adults to the Wednesday night program than they bring to the children's program, I've told them just because we don't have any more, we don't have anywhere else to put them. We're out of space totally. And they said, Pastor, we're going to not be able to bring any more kids if we don't get room. I said, I've got some room you can have. And so I promise you, God is my witness. We'll move the Bible study over there, and they'll broadcast live on the Internet over here. Amen? Let's stand together. God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed.